Okay, now then, we have in a synchro mesh transmission, this is a power flow thing by the way, it's mostly one of the time. Now all the rest of our planetary years from yesterday's session here. In a synchro mesh transmission, the gears slide into and out of engagement. Well, they don't do that. How do they, how does it? How does it put us in gear? How does that happen? You're actually going to do what? Brand it. What are you going to do? How are you going to put it in gear? We went through this the other day. Hmm? Peter, remember the power pole? The input shaft. Okay, let me see if I can draw it. If I'm going to take this input shaft here, which is hooked to the, to the engine, right, and this is where your clutch is, and I'm going into the transmission, and inside here we've got a gear, right, helical cut gear. And that helical cut gear is always meshed with a helical cut gear that's larger than it. Okay, now then, and this is a simplified version of that. Uh, we got a gear that's slightly larger right here, and it's meshed with a gear that's slightly smaller. Never hurts to go through this a few times to make sure. See that actually? Alright. All right. All right. And the next gear is slightly larger than that, and it's meshed with a gear that's slightly smaller. Got it? And then you got a gear here. It's basically, excuse me, slightly larger than that. It's about to get confused in the whole thing. And then we got a little bit of gear. Right. Okay. Right here, let's see. We've got an output shaft. And we're not even going to worry about reverse or fifth gear right now. We're just worried about our first four. You got it? Okay, now, where does this shaft and this shaft Where's it broke at? Very front. Very front, right behind here, right? Right. This right here is where your break is between that shaft and that one. So when you turn this, and all this right here is all machined together. This is all one gear. These gears cannot move independently of each other. And they're riding in bearings in the front and back of the case. And you ought to be able to explain this to somebody. And this is the way they do in the Navy. They actually have somebody like you get up here and explain this to a bunch of guys like me. And when we ask a question, you better know the answer. You know what I mean? Or you'll be out of the nuclear program, you're back swabbing the deck. You got it. All right, now right here, this is where the drive shaft comes up. You got those lines back here. Okay, so if I'm going to get uh, first gear, I'm going to have to take this, which is uh, actually these collars. There's a, there's a collar, shift collars, I call them. That's what I like to call them. Well, I'm not, I'm not drawing the forks. I'm drawing where the forks hook into. Oh, okay. Right. So that, and there's shift forks connected to these. And they can actually move these forward and back. And whenever they move it forward and back, it's going to actually take. And see, when you turn this shaft, this turns with it, even when you're in neutral. I'm turning this shaft. The engine's running. This gear is just whirling up a storm. All these gears are whirling up a storm. None of these gears are connected to that shaft yet. I'm doing this to burn it in. We went over it, but I'm burning it in, okay? All right, so as soon as you want what's going in here to be connected back here, you're going to have to make that connection somehow. Now, if you just wanted it to be a straight connection all the way through, what would you do? That would click click forward, and this is still whirling, but it ain't, it ain't carrying a no load, and that's going straight out the back. If I want it to go in first gear, I'm going to lock. See, this is spinning. I'm going to lock that to this gear, and I'm going to let... This spinning gear drive that one, and now it's driving this one. You understand that? Everybody, I mean, I throw the mud on the wall again and again, and the internals computers on over there. I throw the mud on the wall over and over again until finally some of it sticks. Are you getting this, Mr. Archie? All you guys getting this? You getting this right here? I guess I'll have to play this video back for Levi. I don't worry about it. Um, we made it work too hard yesterday. That's what it was. All right, now then, see? We're going to click this thing forward. See, and you notice how you've got this little bitty gear driving this great big gear. 
and you're going to have a lot of turns on this gear. You got a lot of turns on this, a lot of turns on that, and not many turns on that. And then whenever you lock that one into it, you got slightly bigger gear here, slightly smaller gear, and you're going up all the way. And of course, you know, fifth gear is actually an overdrive race. Everybody got that. Everybody understand that. Don't, don't get messed up on that. So this is basically the answer to this question here. These gears are not going to slide in and out of engagement with one another. There is an exception to that on these kind of transmissions and what gear does slide to engage. Reverse does. It's a spur gear, okay? The number of internal, and so basically, faults. The first one is false. So the gears don't slide in and out of engagement with each other on that one, on a synchro mesh transmission. Um, however, on your big truck transmissions, they use spur gears and they do slide in and out. And that's why the truck driver's got to double clutch that thing and get the RPM right and know how fast he's going, thump, to make it go in there. And a good truck driver is really something to behold. If you ever try to drive one of them big trucks, there ain't nothing easy about getting those gears Get it in, get it in the you know, you, you see these guys driving it, you think, hey, I can do that. You start trying that, you, can, you, go, yeah. you can learn how to do it, but it is not something you're going to learn real fast, you know. It takes a, it's, it's skill, there's skill involved. One time these, when I was over recruiting, I said something, I said, we got a truck driving program over there at MacArthur, too. And when this smart alley kid on the front row says, uh, well, how much money is a truck driver? I said, well, it's 1200 bucks a week if you're working for the right outfit. You know, he make good money doing drive. But I don't, you know, I'm not, over the road. I'm not over the road kind of guy. The number of internal shafts in a manual transmission depends on the number of forward speeds. Well, that's false too. It's got all of, you know, the, all of the car transmissions pretty much is if it's, unless it's a transaxle, it's going to have just the, uh, the uh, two shafts, which would be your cluster here and your, your main shaft. And your, and your main shaft actually consists of an input and output shaft, and your counter shaft is the one, or cluster you're going to call it that, is the one that. Could you explain double clutch? I mean, understand the problem. Well, double clutch, when you max the clutch, you're actually releasing the engine from the, I mean, the engine from the trans, from the transmission input shaft. Right. Well, when you double clutch it, you're actually going to change the speed, you know, of everything to, in other words, you got to actually pay attention to the speed of your engine and all that, you know. Boom, boom. You, you, you do that in order to get everything whirling the right speed so you can drop into the next gear. So you're actually having to do two things. You're not just releasing the clutch. Uh, the synchronizers, the blocker rings that we got in that one actually causes them to turn the right speed, but the truck driver has actually got to synchronize the speed of those gears himself, you know, by watching his tachometer and stuff. You see what I'm saying? So it's, uh, that they just call it double clutching. And people will rev it up. They'll rev, rev. Yeah, my pen leaked on my shirt. In case anybody's wondering, what is pink spotted that did not get shot? This is this, this pink pen that I had to borrow from Caleb because I left my pen at home this morning. Uh, I put it in my pocket like this to start with it leaked all over my shirt. And I've also got a pink stain on me underneath there because I looked and they're kind of clean that off. It's going to come off. So, uh, anyway, I'm a little disgruntled about that, but there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, well, whatever, you know. So, anyway. Um, I didn't know if you knew it. Yeah, and it was there. I've been, I've been, I've been hearing people tell me about it ever since. You can put a little. You can be working at a shop somewhere. This is what's funny. When I was working at Bondi's, over there, there's 25 mechanics over there, and you, you walk all the way across the shop. The shop about 100 yards long. It's real long, you know. And so uh, I go back there and I come back, and you can take it just for the fun of it. You can take a little bit of grease and smear it right here. And before you got back to the parts room, there'd be six mechanics say, "Hey, man, you got grease on your face." Yeah, everybody's gonna point you out. I got grease on. They'd have grease on theirs and be telling you had grease on yours. You know, it bothers people when you got grease on their face. Don't like it. You know? There was a there was a there was a there was a guy that I thought was talking about. Yeah. So you're talking about what do you mean when I say large gear ratio? What am I talking about? Well, I mean, what would you? How would you write a large gear ratio down? No, more to one. More to one. Or something like that. You know? I mean, this, you know. Uh, in a low gear, the drive gear has fewer teeth than the driven gear. The drive gear has fewer teeth than the driven gear. This increases torque and reduces true. speed to the drive wheels. That's true. That is true. That's what we were just talking about. The most torque is needed when a vehicle is moving quickly. All right. The most torque is needed. That's exactly wrong. Yeah. Fifth, uh, fifth, uh, five, excuse me, is a false question. Uh, when the driver shifts the transmission into high gear, engine speed increases. When the driver shifts the transmission into high gear, engine speed increases. Right? Wrong. That's true, That's true right? Wait a minute. Remains the same. What is your transmission turns more than the output shaft? 
Yeah. When it shifted into high gear, when it's high gear number six, think about it now. You can even, you can look at your tack. Everybody that drives and knows that. Yeah. Well, you yeah. start out, if you look at your tack, you're just going, ah. Oh. Yeah. So the engine speed is not increasing, it's decreasing. Right? I mean, that's fairly simple. I can tell Brandon is really bored into that because he waited until he heard me give the answer to that question before he answered it. <laughs> Outstanding performance, Brandon. That's okay, though. No? He's telling surely that. Okay. Now then, um, when the driver shifts the trans, well, excuse me, I, made, I already read that question. The synchronizer sleeve connects the transmission to the shift lever. Sure. Well, to the fork at least. <sighs> the synchronizer sleeve connects the transmission to the shift lever. What do you tell you? You're talking about a fork, right? Not the synchronizer sleeve. The fork connects to the synchronizer sleeve. Remember what I told you, you can wear out that fork too if you're somebody that drives with your hand on a gear shifter all the time. Wear that sucker all the way off. And that is actually false. The fork is what goes to the synchronizer lead. Got it? The fork goes to the synchronizer lead. Cable linkage is the most common type of transmission shift linkage. What uses cable shift linkage? Huh? Usually, yeah, front wheel drive usually uses it. Although not always, some of them use, you know, Non-cable linkage. What about our Escort? Does it have cables? Yeah, yeah. Or does it have something else? The answer is either yeah or I think it's got something else. Yeah. It has some good choices there. Okay. All right. Before disassembling a transmission, you should inspect each component for damage and wear. No. After you disassemble the transmission. <laughs> you, can't, you can't even see them. I'm going to tell you something, though. And I told you this before. I mentioned this before. People would, I told my people would bring my dad a transmission in a box when he had his shop. Yeah. I mean, not a little box, maybe a back of a pickup. And they said, this transmission making noise, can you fix it for me? And he said, no, put it back in the car and bring it back over here. And I'll drive the car and I'll listen to the noise. Then I'll fix the transmission. Now, I'm not going to fix nothing. Cause, and I asked him about that one day when I was just a teenager. And he said, I can't fix noises unless I hear the noises. Because you can look at the gears and you won't see anything wrong with them. You cannot visually inspect a gear in, in every case and tell if it's going to be noisy. It will look beautiful. It will be polished. It will look like it's going to be a perfect gear, and it will whine. It's, it's up a storm. And uh, gears are weird like that. Gears will make a whining noise when it looks like there's no reason for it. There was a differential. Let me briefly tell this story right here while I'm here. There was a differential I was working on. Uh, this uh, guy named Bert that, you know, uh, had a a lot of money, but he was sort of tight with it. He drove this uh, International Scout when I was working at an International dealership back in the mid-80s. And the, one of the, the differential carrier, you know, around the spider gears, the West, like that's what you was full with yesterday, mm -hmm. broke. It just popped. And it was, the, then your preload on your bearings is meaningless and all that because everything's kind of moving around. And it was making noise in there and all that. And so they says, uh, I asked Bert, I looked at those gears and they looked just fine. I said, Bert, how long did you drive this thing after starting this noise? He said, oh, my, I parked it right away. I didn't drive it at all. Well, that's hogwash because he had driven this thing a couple of hours, you know, wondering if the noise was going to get worse. And, just, and what he did with all these gears wallowing around on each other and all that kind of thing, he mismatched those gears. But you couldn't look at them and tell that. This is what I'm, where I'm going with that, right? So I'm saying, well, um, rather than getting him ringer, I was gonna, just going to get him a... Uh, a uh, carrier, and I got the carrier, put the spider gears in it, put it all together, put the ring gear on it, and put it in there, set it all up, you know, you paint it, what we do in those days is we paint the gears, and Ford does that too, when they build rear ends, they paint the gears with some marking compound, you turn them through and you look for the pattern to be right, and you can say, you can set your pinion depth different or whatever, but we were using the same ring gear and pinion they already had, so put it all together, and they're matched by the way, the ring gear and the pinion are matched sets, you can't swap, you know, can't mix and match those, so, yeah, so anyway, put all that stuff back together, and I drove this doggone thing, and I had built rear ends before, and I knew how to build a rear end, and this thing was wang, 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 just singing up a storm, I said, oh man, he told me, and I says, uh, and I, so I went to the boss man, I said, what am I going to do about this, and he says, there's another rear end down there in the back, you see if it's got the same gear ratio, because on a four wheel drive, you got to have the same gear ratio all the way around. He said, see if you've got the same gear ratio on that one as you don't listen. If you do, pull the gears out of that rear end down there and put them in his and see if they're quieter. And that way we can dodge a bullet. You know, we went to make $350 worth of gears or whatever. And so I went down there, and there's this rear end laying down there in the weeds. Been in the rain down there for no doubt how long. And it's full of water. 
and everything's rusty. That's why when the boss man said, I didn't use that. That's a rusty bunch of crap down there. He says, no, just go ahead and pull that stuff out. Well, he's paying me salaries or whatever, you know, so I pull all that stuff apart, pop those gears in there, set them up, just as quiet. <laughs> and make no noise. And they don't have big flakes of rust and pits and all. I guess that just gave their oil a lot of places to be or something. But I mean, I think he charged him sixty-five dollars for those gears too. And the guy was grabbing. We trying to save him money by not putting new gears in to start with. We was kind of dumb. She went and sold him old schmear or another rear end. But whatever happened, that's one of them twenty-twenty hindsight things. I had I had no idea the rusty gears were going to be as quiet as they were. You know, he looked at him. He said, "Gosh, you can't use that. This is nonsense." Rusty, yeah, the rusty ones were quiet. I put them in there, set them up there, just as quiet as they could be. And I just, I, I, that defies this reason because I felt like they'd be grinding, make, making grinding noises and everything else. Um, okay, uh, let's see. The installation process for a transmission is the same as the removal process. Now that's a stupid question. I don't know why they put that in there. You know, good and doggone well you're taking the bolts out and whatnot when you're taking them out and putting them in. When you're, it's not going to be the same. Uh, okay. Um, Something else too. Uh, you guys might see if you see on these uh, transmissions. I'm going to erase all this. Watch this. And this is something. There was a guy from, uh, you know, and I'm dropping a name from NABC that came to work at the Ford place over in Dothan. And he was a pretty good mechanic, really. He was. He had learned quite a lot up there. His problem solving skills were kind of like Brandon's, though. He didn't know how to break anything loose. It would break loose real easy. Put a wrench on it, just started turning. If it doesn't turn, this is how Brandon did yesterday on the brakes. He, got, he starts out, he's got this bolt that's got a half inch head on it, and the half inch is a little smaller than 13 millimeter. So he gets a 13 millimeter, and he begins the process of rounding that bolt off. Okay, and so then I says, that is not a 13 millimeter. That is a 5 16 USS, you know, in other words, an English size, an imperial size. 5 16 It's a five, Well, the bolt was 5 16 but the head was half inch. Oh, okay. See where I'm going with that? Yeah. I said, this is actually a, a standard size. It's not metric. So I says, go get you a half inch socket. So he goes and gets a 12 point half inch socket and he finishes rounding it off. Does a beautiful job. It's perfectly round. <laughs> Left it all anymore. And then he says, I have no idea what to do with this thing now. What do I do? I said, well, what are you going to do? Throw the truck away? I mean, you've know, you got you to get out there somehow. Well, so anyway, I did the air hammer trick, you know, and you got it broke loose. But anyway, they've got these little, these bearings, like this right here. Right? And Tyler may have heard me talk about this before, but I think he was in the outline. Them bearings, little bearings, they're no bigger around than probably this. That's the pilot bearing that goes around here in that thing. On the ones that have pilot bearings, not all front wheel drives have pilot bearings. All right, this little sucker here, it's got little needles all in it. Well, occasionally this needle will come apart. It'll come apart, the needles will come out of it. And what you'll wind it up with, what you'll wind up, and this thing is a really tight fit up in the end of that crankshaft, too. And sometimes it's in the flywheel, but usually it'll be up in the crankshaft. You, you've seen these before? It's a, it's a pain. All right, and this is a little, this is little thin metal that's, that's hardened. It's really tight up in there. And this is actually, usually it'll be broken a couple of places, like this right here and all that. So this guy came to me and he said, I don't know how to get that out of there. How do you get them out? I can never get them out. I could. I get them out real easy and it's fun to get them out. <laughs> well, the thing about it was, he, he walked over there and he said, how them back in? Uh, well, that's not a problem. You can actually put them back in fairly easily if you're a real cowboy. If you're not a real cowboy, you have trouble. And I'm trying to make real cowboys here. Okay, so this is what I do. I take this, if you take a look at a cross section of this, you know, basically it looks like that inside there, right? In other words, if you look at the cross section of it, and all these needles that used to be in here are gone. You know, they used to be up there, they done fell out and turned to dust and all that crap. Furthermore, this is grabbing a hold of your input shaft and it's trying to turn it a little bit, and you, even though you mash the clutch, the input shaft is still turning a little bit and you're trying to put it in gear and it goes, you know, this kind of stuff. All right, so you know what a carriage bolt is? Carriage bolt. Anybody seen a carriage bolt? The head of it is dome shaped and it's got a little square shoulder on it. And it's threaded. This is what it looks like. If you look at it, let me see if I can get over here. I'm going to wipe that off. A carriage bolt, you've seen them, you just didn't know that's what they were. A carriage bolt looks like this and it'll have a square shoulder and then it's got threads. That's what oh, you yeah. usually, see that? Yeah, That's what you usually have your vice in there in. Okay, so I said, okay, I had a carriage, I had a carriage bolt in my doggone uh, uh, 
toolbox. It's in my junk drawer, the top drawer of my junk drawer, nothing but little bits and pieces and bolts and nuts and all that stuff. And so I took this carriage bolt and looking at it from the top, it's round. Right? You got it? So I ground it off, I guess right here. Alright. Now it's still got now from the side it's still round. And I and I worked it up in here like this. Got that? All right, I put that in there like that. And then, of course, you got your square shoulder, which is not a big deal. You get a socket, which is bigger than that thing. And through that socket, your threads are sticking out. And you put a nut on here with a washer. And you turn that nut, and it just draws that thing right on out of there. <coughs> As a matter of fact, laying there on my desk, I have one I pulled out that way and the bolt I used to do it. The Escort, whenever there's a couple of guys put a transmission Escort, was like that. It was busted up like that and I went and got a carriage bolt, fouled it out, works every time. Unless, the only time it doesn't work is if some yo-yo has broken that entire lip off trying to get it out and there's no, you know, there's no lip to grab. But that lip is strong enough. But see, this is a nice steady pull. You know, you put a little grease on those threads and you just turn your wrench and it pulls this thing right out of its interference fit uh, crankshaft right into your socket and you got it in your hand. Now I putting the other one in, you know, you use a little bushing driver and just bump it back in there. You know, if you just kind of bang it in there, you know, with any kind of claw hammer or whatever, yeah, you'll mess it up. You know, you got to, you got to, you, you can't, you know, got to be use some discretion there. All right. So anyway, the manual transmission does not. A, supply power and torque from the engine to the drivetrain and the wheels. Does it do that? Does it not allow the driver to change forward or reverse direction of the vehicle, does it? Or does it not? Does it not allow the driver to disconnect the engine from the drivetrain for starting and idling? Does it not provide automatic downshifts? It doesn't. When you downshift, you're going to hear it go because you're having to do that yourself. Uh, if you just stop, it's going to stall. An engine's most efficient speed range is called its what? Power band, power torque, band. synchronous speed, or overdrive? The power, band. power band. Efficient speed range. That's when it's got the most power. And that usually hits about 3,500 RPM, then it drops off. You know, About 3,500 RPM if you see one on a dyno. Unless you got some hot rod engine, like the, the SHO Taurus with those intake runner, manifold runner controls would actually, uh, it would, when it hit about 4,000 and they would open, it would go up a little more. So. That's how they would work. How much is a dyno? What? How much is a dyno? Like a, like a car on? No, the one that I priced was like twenty thousand dollars. But yeah, two of them. But I, actually, there's dynos that you just bolt the engine up to, yeah, too. You know. But I'm talking about. I was going to hit with rollers in the floor. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know, and that's okay, but it doesn't really serve twenty thousand dollars worth of purpose for my purposes. Because how can you, you check your front end alignment on that? Well, you can, you know, I don't know, you, you could build one if you had a machine shop and all the right stuff, but if something happens and that thing locks up whenever you've got it chained down, it's not going to jump off or it's not going to jump off. Still be in front of that thing. All right. The transmission case is made of what? Well, excuse me. The transmission case, A, is made of high carbon steel. B, includes many minute holes to let air through. C, locks in the pressure caused by heat expansion. Or D, locates the shafts and bearings in proper alignment. Yeah. What is it, guys? To begin with, what's the transmission case made out of? Can anybody even answer that question for me? It's cast iron or cast aluminum. Right? It ain't high carbon steel. B, does it include minute holes to let air through? Heck no, it would leak all over the place if it did. Remember that? Remember, I told you if you got a trans, if you have a manual transmission that's got an oil leak, you better be fixing it because you're not always going to remember to put oil in it when it's leaked out. It's going to burn that sucker up. It doesn't quit working like an automatic transmission when it gets low on oil. It waits until it's, it has ruined itself before it quits working. Yeah. You know, it can get kind of noisy. All right. And uh, does it lock in the pressure caused by heat expansion? No, it's going to have a vent. They all got vents on. And it locates the shafts and bearings in proper alignment. That's what it does. That one is a D. All right, 14, if a drive gear has 12 teeth and the driven gear has 48, the gear ratio is what? 
Everybody like that answer? Four to one? Four to one. For every, every four turns on the drive gear, you got 48 on the driven gear. 15 transmission lubricants do not do what? Do they lubricate the gears? Yes. Do they cool bearings and gears? No. Do they protect against rust and corrosion? No. Do they all have the same viscosity? No, Heck no. Some of them, you know, sometimes they got automatic transmission fluid, sometimes they got 50 weight oil, all that kind of stuff. All right. 